Hello and welcome back to Neural Data Science. Today we're going to be learning about for loops in Python. So here I am on CoCalc. I'm going to go into for loops and open up my for loops notebook and scroll back to the top. All right. So for loops, the, the question here is how can I make a program do things repeatedly? And so our learning objectives are to explain what for loops are normally used for to trace the execution of a simple unnested loop and correctly state the values of variables in each iteration, and write for loops that use the accumulator pattern to aggregate values. As we go through some of that jargon and what it means will become more clear to you. So a for loop executes commands once for each value in a collection. So if we were trying to do calculations on the values in a list, for example, or uh, on as a bunch of values stored in separate variables, it'd be quite tedious because we'd have to enter a line of code for each item in the list or each variable. A for loop tells Python to execute some statements once for each value in a list or a character string or some other collection, like a, say a dictionary. The for command basically means for each thing in this group, do these operations. So here's our first example of a for loop. We can write for number in square bracket two comma three comma five, close our square brackets, add a colon. So this is a list, right? Two, three, five inside square brackets is a list in Python. So we're saying for each number in this list, enter. And you can see when I hit enter, uh, Jupyter indents the next line, which is syntax for the for statement, as I'll explain more in a minute. But the, the body of the for loop, what we want it to actually run each time for each number is to print that number. So a very simple for loop. Shift enter to run this. And we can see that the output is two, then three, then five. So for each number in that list, it printed the number, what we told it to do. So that for loop is equivalent to three print statements, print two, print three, print five the output would be the same in both cases. The difference is that if we use explicit print statements for each one, we need three lines of code, whereas the for loop allows us to do that in only two lines of code. But more importantly, this list could have 10 or even 100 or even 1,000 or whatever number of values in it, and we'd still only need two lines of code to print out uh, all of those numbers because the for loop creates this, this loop, this efficiency for us. So it's scalable to any length of input, and it's flexible because sometimes you don't even know how many values that you need to operate on, or across different data files, there might be different numbers of values or something like that. So for loops are both scalable and they're more flexible and adaptable. So as I noted, the three sort of key parts of a for loop are a collection, so in this case, the list, two, three, five, a loop variable, which in this case was number, and a body which is the commands that are indented under that for statement that are applied or run every time there's a pass through the loop. I'm not going to type this again because I already typed it up above. So the first line of a for loop has to start with the word for and end with a colon. And then the body of the, the for loop, so again the commands that you want to run repeatedly, need to be indented under that line that ends with a colon. Whoops. And in fact, indentation is always meaningful in Python. So this indent specifically tells Python that the commands in here are part of the for loop. And the way Python knows when you're done your for loop is that the next line that's not part of the for loop is not indented. So here's an example where uh, we have a for loop again. So for country, so country is my loop variable in, to find a list of countries, Canada, USA, comma, Mexico, and then end that line with a colon, enter, print country. Okay, so that's a, a very similar for loop to what we saw up above. But now I'm going to hit enter, and I'm going to hit enter again just to separate sort of visually the for loop from the next command. And the next command is print all done printing country names. All right, so what you can see is that this line is not indented, so that won't be repeated every time. That'll be just run a single time after the for loop has executed. So I shift enter to run that, and you can see we get Canada, USA, Mexico, and then all done printing country names. 
So this empty line here that I put between the for loop and the command that's outside the for loop, it's not actually required. So if I deleted that line, the code would still run. So Python knows as soon as it encounters a line that's not indented, that's not part of the for loop, the for loop is ended. But just in terms of writing clean, readable code, it's a lot cleaner to uh, read this code if there's a blank line between the end of your for loop and the next command. And just a, a little tip, if you're on a Mac and you press command and the left square bracket key, you'll unindent a line. And on Windows, that would be control and the left square bracket key. And in fact, the other, the reverse, so command or control and the right square bracket key indents lines again. So that's a quick and easy way to, to format your code with indents. Okay, another thing to know is because indentation is always meaningful, the code below generates an error. So if I write life underscore exp underscore 1900 equals 48.1 and correct my typo, life exp 1920 equals 56.6. But if I indent that line at all, one space, two spaces, doesn't matter, we get an indentation error. There's an unexpected indent. So indentation is always meaningful in Python. Uh, it throws an error here because the line above that indented line wasn't a for statement or there's other kinds of statements uh, that could have an indented body. It was none of those, it didn't end in colon. So that indent is not expected. It's confusing Python, so it won't even run the code. And in fact, to answer this question, is an indentation error a syntax error or a runtime error? It's a syntax error. And the reason it's a syntax error is because when Python is told to run code, when you execute a cell, it first looks over that code and does a syntax check and makes sure that all of your code uh, conforms to Python's syntax rules. So that's things like if you open a parenthesis, you close a parenthesis. If you open quotes, you close quotes. If you have indents, they're appropriately done. They're inside for loops or, or other kinds of uh, sections that should be indented. So it, it does that check before it even tries to run the code because there's no point in running it if there's a syntax error. So the indent is a syntax error. The runtime errors only occur when you actually run the code and it realizes there's some problem with your code. Okay, so moving on, uh, the loop variable, so the variable that we define in the loop right after the for statement, can be called anything. So you can see I've got two examples here for kitten in 235, a list, print kitten, or for ytrjmn in the same list, print ytrjmn. Both of those are totally valid Python code. Those would run. Those would print 2, 3, and 5, just like for number in 2, 3, 5, print number. But they're not as good in terms of coding style because these numbers have nothing to do with kittens. Calling it for kitten in 2, 3, 5 might be appropriate if you were dealing with data from kittens. Uh, and the second one just doesn't conform to the rule that we learned very early in this course that variable names should be meaningful. So some random collection of, of letters, just it, it's not meaningful. It's uh, nobody's going to understand what your code is doing, including you when you come back to it. So clear and meaning variable names are best practice. Now, that said, you can sometimes use short forms or abbreviations because if the, the loop variable is only being used inside the loop, um, there may be no reason to give it a, a fancy name. And in some cases, you might even think, well, I can't even actually think of a good name for this because it's just some variable that I want to use to loop over. So you'll very often see single letter loop variables. So in this example, we've got life underscore exp equals and then a list. And with data in lists, I'm happy to copy and paste them because you make less errors that way. And with data, you definitely don't want errors. Okay, so we define our list and then we say for e in life underscore exp colon Oh, I didn't say either, print E, and that works. So E could be short for expectancy. It's just a single letter. That's also a fine practice. The other trick that I threw in here is to show you that you don't actually need to define your list directly in the for loop. So up above, we had for kitten in, and then we defined a list inside square brackets right in that for loop. 
but probably much more commonly, you'll see that you've got data that's defined outside of the for loop, like this list life expectancy. And then you just use that variable name as the collection in your for loop. So that works totally fine, works the same way. Another interesting thing that is occasionally, but not always useful, is that you can use strings to control uh, the number of times you go through a loop. So in this example, I say for C in, and in quotes, I'll do double quotes, surge, colon. So here I use C because I'm going for each character in the string, print C. And what we get is it prints each character from that string out on a separate line. So it loops through each character in the string. Sometimes that's useful if you have specific reasons uh, to work with character strings. Um, and you can use that just by defining a character string that's the number of times you want to go through the loop. But that seems like a, a slightly weird and, and convoluted way to approach that problem. Uh, next thing to know is that the body of a loop can contain many statements. So in this case, we have a loop that has three commands inside of it. So we're going to say primes is our collection, and it's a list, same numbers actually, two, three, and five. And then for p in primes, so the first line is squared equals p star star two. So those are asterisk, asterisks, which are obtained by shift and then the eight key. And one of those means multiplication, two in a row like this without a space, means raised to the power of. So this means p to the power of two, which is p squared. And then the next line is cubed, and we assign to cubed the value p star star, so to the power of three. So p cubed. And then we ask it to print p, the original value, and then squared, and then cubed run that cell. So each line, the print statement generates three values, the original two, two squared is four, two cubed is eight, etc, etc. So you can see that you can run basically any number of commands inside a for loop. And it works just fine. Another thing to note about that is that although these variables inside the for loop are updated each time through the for loop, when it ends, whatever the last value that was assigned to each variable was, that's still stored in memory. So on this next line, if I ask it to print p, p still has a value of 25. If I ask it to print squared, it has a value of 25, and so on. So whatever the final values of these variables were at the end of the for loop, those are stored in memory. Another trick you can use is that you can use a function called range to iterate over a sequence of numbers. So imagine that we wanted to do something 10 times. We could define a list with the numbers 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So that's 10 numbers and have it use a for loop through that list. But again, that's, not, that's a bit tedious. It's not scalable to larger numbers. So Python offers this range function where I can say for i... And again, my, my loop variable is just a single letter. For i in range 10, colon, print i. And what this does is it prints out the numbers 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way up to 9. So when you give the range function a single argument as a number, the range function generates all the numbers from 0, because Python always starts from 0, up to but not including the value that you gave it in that range command. So that's like slicing where when we use the colon to slice, say, a number of elements in a list, uh, our slice goes from the starting number that we give it, starting index, to the number that we give it at the end, minus one. So the range function works the same way. If we don't want to start at zero, we can also give the range two values, and the first one becomes the start, the last value becomes the end, again, with this sort of n minus one rule. So I can say for i in range 10, 15, print i. 
So you can see that when we print out i in this case, it starts from 10 and it goes up to, but not including the second argument, 15. An interesting thing about the range function is that although it can substitute for typing out a list in something like a for statement, it doesn't actually produce a list. It just produces the numbers in sequence as you go through a list and uh, or as you go through the range. So if I say print the value of range 10, the output isn't the numbers like a list 0 to 9. It just says range 0 comma 10. And if I ask, well, what type? is uh, range 10. So what Python data type? So print type range 10. It's of class range. So a range is a specific Python data type that can be used to generate sequences of numbers, kind of like a list, but it doesn't actually produce a list. And that's important to know because often once people learn the range function, they think, oh, I can use this to make lists. You can't. Okay, so now we're moving into a pattern that's actually quite common in programming, which is called the accumulator pattern, which turns many values into one. So you define a variable and then each time through the loop, you update the value of that variable. So you change it. So in this case, what we're gonna do is start by defining what we call an accumulator variable. So this is a variable that we're gonna update each time through the list, but it has to be created before we can update it. So we're going to say total, equals zero. And then for number in range one comma 11. So I'm saying one comma 11 for range because I want to start at one and go up to 10. Colon. Total equals total plus number. And then finally I'll print total. Okay, so what this is gonna do is it's gonna start for number in range one to 11. So it'll start with number is equal to one, total is equal to zero. So when it runs this command, total equals total plus number, it takes the current value of total, zero plus number, which is one. So zero plus one equals one, assigns that back to total. So it replaces the current value of total with a new value. Then the next time through the loop, number is equal to two. So total was one plus two is three. So the new value of total gets updated as three. So in that way, this is why it's called an accumulator is total is accumulating value each time we're adding to it. Okay, so when I run that at the end, the total is 55. But if I add a print statement, so print total inside my loop, you can see what's happening as it's updating. So each time through the loop, it starts out as one, then three, then six. So again, it's accumulating each time up to 55 55 is printed twice there because it's printed once as the final value in the loop, and then we print it again outside of the loop. Accumulators can also be empty lists, and this is where that dot append method that we learned in the list lesson uh, can be really useful. So we can define our accumulator variable, we'll call it output, and it equals an empty list, just a, a set of square brackets with nothing inside. Then I can say for i in range 10, so I'm going to go from 0 to 9, whoops, colon, output dot append i times 2. So in this case, we're not changing the value of up to output each time through because we're appending. So the first time through the loop, uh, i will have a value of 0. So i times 0 times 2 is 0. So the first item in the output list will be 0. The next time through the loop, i will be 1. So we're going to append 1 times 2 is 2. So now our list will be 0, comma 2. So we're appending new items to the list each time. And you can see the end result by outside of the for loop printing output. So once it's done running that for loop. So you can see your output is a list, 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, et cetera, et cetera. So you can start with that empty list and then add things into the list. Um, but again, you need this accumulator variable that you define prior to running the for loop so that you have something that you can just automatically add things to each time through the for loop. Another cool thing in Python is something called list comprehension. And this is a special kind of for loop that you can use to create a list in a single line of code. Because it's in a single line of code, it can be a very powerful and compact way of doing things. 
So for example, this code will create a list of values from one to 10 in a single line of code. So rather than defining an accumulator variable and then writing a for statement with a colon and then uh, some command inside that for statement, so that's at least three lines of code, I can do it in one line of code. So uh, list comprehensions are written inside of a list. So you start by typing your square brackets then you have your loop variables, in this case, which is x. So x for x in range 1, 11. So for x in range 1, 11 is identical to the kind of for statement we've seen above. Just it doesn't end in a colon. The difference is for list comprehension, we put this inside the square brackets. And then we have this other x at the beginning, which basically means for x in range 1 to 11, put x in this list and do that for all the values in x. So when I run this, I get the list of values from 1 to 10. Um, <clears throat> we can also assign that out. So I can say my list equals that and then print my list. So that would be a little more equivalent to the way we were doing things before where we accumulate and then we print out the end result. Um, and that also just shows that you can directly assign the result of a list comprehension to a variable and you get a list. So this can be really useful, especially if you want to apply the same operation to every value in a list that you have. So for more of a, a sort of neuropsychology data science example, imagine that we have this uh, list called time underscore sec. So it's reaction times in seconds from 10 trials in an experiment. And again, I'm gonna copy and paste those values because they're long and complicated. We don't wanna make mistakes with our data. And to convert them to milliseconds, we have to multiply the values in seconds by 1000. So we can do that using list comprehension by saying time underscore MS. So our new output list will be time in milliseconds. Square bracket, T times 1000 for t in time underscore sec. And then I'll print the result of that time ms. So this list comprehension is exactly what we saw before, but instead of just appending each value of our, our list back into a new list, we're doing something to it. We're multiplying it by a thousand and then putting it uh, in the new list. So you can see that we get new values. So instead of 0.198, we get 198.59. Another thing we can do very often in this kind of research, we want to round milliseconds to whole milliseconds because that's the ultimate level of precision we want. The decimal places are, are just sort of excess data and overly precise that we don't need. So here's an example where we use that same time underscore sec list but now we do two things. We're nesting commands in our list comprehension. So time underscore ms equals, open our square brackets, and we're running a round command. And then the argument to the round command is t times 1,000. Oops, typo. And then still inside the square brackets for t in time underscore sec. And then we'll print out time underscore ms. And now you can see, and remember with the round command, if you only give it a single argument, it rounds the values to integers, to whole numbers. So you can see those values now as whole, uh, whole numbers. All right, so this brings us to exercises. And as always, I encourage you to pause the video at this point, work through the exercises on your own, see how far you get, then unpause and we'll work through the solutions together. Okay, so for our first exercise, the, the goal is tracing execution and note that the cell that we're gonna put our answer in is a markdown cell. It's not even a code cell because I don't want you to actually run the code. I want you to think about the code and what's it, what it's gonna generate. So what would be the values of total and C each time through the loop? So at, let's say, I'm gonna say time zero. So at the start of things, um, I'm going to use some fancy markdown here. Let's use, let's make time zero uh, second level heading. I'll remove the colon. And total is equal to zero. 
and for C and TN, well, before we run the loop, C is undefined. Okay, and then at time one, so the first time through, and let's say, let's worry about C first. So for C and TN, the first value of C is T. So C equals T. And total is total plus one. So zero plus one is one. At time two, so the second time through the loop, C has a value of I. Total has a value of, so it was total was one. Now we add one, so total has a value of two. Time three, C is equal to N and total is increased by a value of one, so it ends up being three. And then I enter the cell to nicely format my markdown. So what's interesting about this loop, and I sort of mentioned this up before, is you can use a string to control the number of times that a loop executes. In this case, we're not even using our, our loop variable C inside the loop. We're just using that string to control that we want to run through the loop three times. And you know, ultimately, you could use that to count the number of characters in a string. Uh, you could also use the when function, which is a lot more uh, practical and efficient. But it's just to show that you can use the length of the string to control the number of passes through a loop without really caring about what the string is beyond something that has a particular length to it. All right, the next exercise is reversing a string. And here what we want to do is fill in the blanks so we get some of the code but fill in the blanks uh, to uh, write code that reverses the order of the letters in this string semordin lap. Okay, so I'm going to copy that, paste it below, and then, okay, so our original is that string. Our result, well, result is our accumulator variable. So we want result to ultimately be the reverse of that. So it's going to be a string because original is a string. Our output's going to be a string, but we don't have any values for it yet. So it's just going to be an empty string. So I'll type quote marks. That's an empty string. Okay, so that's my accumulator variable. And now uh, for character in original, so it's going to step through each character from left to right. So starting with S, result equals what? Well, it's going to be the character plus the result. So whatever the result was before, we're going to add a new character. Remember that the plus sign applied to characters or strings appends them in the order that you give it. So it's going to append character to the front of result. So first time through, character is going to be S, result is empty, so result is going to be S. Next time through, character is E, so it's going to be E plus S. So the E is going to be moved to the beginning before the S. So in this way, we're building up the string in reverse. So when I run that, I get palindromes, which is cute because palindromes are words that are read the same forwards and backwards. This isn't a palindrome, but it's still a cute, nerdy little example. OK, next example is practice accumulating. So here, we want to fill in the blanks to produce the desired result, which is 12. Um, so we want to print the total number of characters in all the words in the list. So basically, as we go through our, our loop, we want to assess the length of the current uh, word that we have and add that to the sum of the lengths of previous words. So again, I'll take this code, copy it, paste it, and fill in the blanks. So total equals 0. That's our accumulator variable. So inside the loop, we want to use total again because we know that our accumulator variable is the one that we want to append or, or update. Uh, it's an integer. And total equals what plus the length of the current word? Well, total, because that's our accumulator variable. So in this accumulator pattern, you're always adding something new to the pre-existing value of your accumulator variable. So total starts out as 0, 
For the first word, the length of the word is 3, so it's going to be 0 plus 3. That's the new value of total. Next time through, the length of green is 5, so total was 3 plus 5 is 8, so our new value of total is 8, etc., etc. So when I run that, my value is 12. That's the correct answer. Next exercise is to print the lengths of each word in the list. So we want to output a list with the lengths of the three words that we gave it as input, rather than sum in those lengths together. So since it's showing us, let me just copy and paste that code. Since it's telling us that we want our output to be a list, our accumulator variable should be an empty list to start with. And then we have four word in red, green, blue, links, and it's giving us a dot, which tells us we want to apply a method. The method to add things to a list is append, as we covered up above and in a previous lesson. And what do we want to append to links? Well, it's the len, the length of the current word, which is in the loop variable word. Run that. And indeed, we get the correct answer of 3, 5, and 4. OK, now we're going to work with the characters in the strings rather than their length. So here we're defining words as a list already, rather than defining it right in the for loop. So words equals red, green, blue. Result equals, well, our result, we want it to be a string. So we're going to start with an empty string. And for something, let's call it again our, our loop variable we word, like in previous examples, for word in words, because words is our list that we defined above. And now we have to write the whole line of code. So result is our accumulator variable. So we want to assign whatever result we're computing to result. So result equals. And what we want to do is concatenate all the words of the list into one string. So um, basically result equals result plus word. And again, remember that the plus sign working with strings and characters just sticks them together in the sequence that we have. So we'll add each new word to the right-hand side of our result string. Run that, and we get red, green, blue. Uh, next step is to create an acronym, uh, RGB, from the first letters of red, green, and blue. And this time we have to write all the code. So I'm going to start by copying the code from up above because that is a bit similar to what we want to do here in that our desired output is a string. So we want to start with result as an empty string. Um, but instead of adding the whole string to the existing accumulator variable, we want to do something different because we want to take just the first character. So how do we take just the first character of a string? We use indexing, and the index for the first character is 0, so word square bracket 0. Result equals result plus the first character of the word that we're currently on. And so if I run that, we're not done yet, but I run that, I get RGB. And then the other thing that we have to do is make those capital letters. And our hint tells us that Python has a dot upper method that works on characters and strings. So there's actually two ways that we can get to the correct solution. One is that we can apply dot upper here. And that will, when it's appending each letter to the string, it'll be making a capital at the same time. That gives us RGB. The other thing is rather than doing it every time through the loop, I can just apply upper once uh, when I'm printing the result. So result print result dot upper also gives me RGB. A third option, which adds a, an extra line of code, is to say result equals result dot upper. And then I don't need it in my print statement. That also works. So you can apply that dot upper method at any point. The difference between what I'm showing now and the previous one where I said print result dot upper is that if I wanted to actually use result in more than just my print statement, then it makes more sense to assign the correct value, the uppercase version, to the variable name result, rather than just printing it out as uppercase. Because when I print result.upper, it doesn't actually make the value of result uppercase. 
it just applies that during the print command. Okay, we're coming close to the end here, just a couple more. Uh, so the next task is to reorder and properly indent the lines of code so they print a list with the cumulative sum of the data. So I'm going to copy this, add a cell. Okay, so first we know that we're using an accumulator pattern, so the first thing we need to do is define our accumulator variable or variables. So cumulative equals empty list. That should probably go at the start. And sum equals zero. That should probably also go at the start because those both look like uh, cases where we're assigning some sort of starting value or, or empty uh, definition for a variable that we'll add to later. Uh, and then maybe we want to start our for loop and then figure out what goes inside our for loop. Well, for number and data, well, okay. So I guess we need to also define what data is before we run for number in data, because we always have to define variables before we use them. Okay, so for number in data, we want to, well, cumulative append dot sum. Well, probably we want to update sum before we append it. So what if I put sum plus equals number there and then <clears throat> do that and print cumulative 13510 that is the correct answer so there you go so hopefully that sort of shows you my my thought process in thinking through okay if we know how code should be structured it's logical how we order the, the commands to to achieve that end all right and then the final one was kind of a starts with a thought question which is in the sample code, seasons equals, and it lists four strings. Print my favorite season is seasons square bracket four. What's wrong with this? Why does it generate an error? Well, it generates an error because the in seasons, we have spring is in position zero, one, two, three. So we have no list item four. So referencing list item four will throw an error because there's nothing there. That's a runtime error because Python doesn't check indexing and how many things you actually have in a list until it tries to run the code. So it's a runtime error. And the way to fix it would be to change that number to a valid number. So zero, one, two, or three, depending on what your favorite season is. Personally, I think my favorite season is summer. So I would change it to that. And let's just copy that, put it in a runnable cell just to show that it runs. There we go. All right, so to summarize, a for loop executes commands once for every value in a collection. For loops made up of a collection, a loop variable, and a body. The first line of the for loop has to end with a colon, and the body below it has to be indented. Indentation is always meaningful in Python. So in other words, those indents tell Python when you've got a block of code that's part of a for loop or, or some other uh, structure that we'll talk about uh, later on in the course. Loop variables can be called anything, but it's strongly advised uh, that you have some sort of meaningful name for the looping variable or use something simple like a single letter if you can't think of a good meaningful name. The body of a loop itself can contain any number of statements. Um, we can use range to iterate over a sequence of numbers. So rather than um, giving it a collection like a list uh, beforehand, you can just use the range command to control the number of times through the loop. The accumulator pattern turns many values into one, so it updates a particular variable's value each time through the loop. And then finally, list comprehension is a powerful way to create lists using a for loop inside a single line of code. All right, so that brings us to the end of our lesson on for loops. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next lesson.